Good afternoon, this is Celia Lacayo, Associate Director of Community Engagement with LA Social Science, continuing the book series. And today we're very excited to have Laura Gomez, who is a professor at the UCLA Law School and also affiliated with uh, the Sociology and Chicano Studies Department. And she's currently the Faculty Director of the Critical Race Studies Program. Um, hi, Laura, how are you today? Hi, Celia, it's great to be with you today. So um, Laura's book is entitled Inventing Latinos, A New Story of American Racism. Um, I have read it cover to cover and it is a book that everybody should pick up. And Laura is going to explain uh, to us uh, the critical contributions um, and why it's such a relevant book in our time right now. Um, so Laura, can you tell us what is the genesis of this book? Um, how does this historical and critical examination of Latinos um, as a racial group, how did it come about? I, I think that the, 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 the genesis, to, to, to share the genesis of this book, we have to go back to my last book, Manifest Destinies, The Making of the Mexican-American Race, um, which came out originally in 2007. And there I was really looking at that question of are Mexican-Americans better thought of as an ethnic group or a racial group. And I come out on the side that they're a racial group by looking at the time period of the, the first Mexican Americans. So from the end of the US-Mexico War in 1848 through New Mexico statehood in 1912. And really what I wanted to do in this book is I wanted to say, well, what happens in the rest of the 20th century? And what happens coming up through the first few decades of the 21st century? And so this book is really taking it forward in time, but also making it bigger, taking in other Latino national origin groups, right? Because I think when, when I looked at the evidence, there is actually a very common dynamic, um, even though there are significant differences among national origin groups, especially when you look at Puerto Ricans in the 20th century, there are many commonalities with the Mexican American experience in terms of racialization. Um, and, and, and also the fact that Mexican Americans are seven out of 10 Latinos and Puerto Ricans are the next biggest group, are 10% are of all Latinos. That is, you know, a central focus of the 20th century material. Um, and, then, and then we move into talking a lot about Central Americans, but that is how I came to, to really think about this project is I wanted to come to the present moment. Little did I know that the present moment was gonna be so ripe for this work um, because of the uprisings of the summer and the, the I think the reckoning that we're having with, um, white supremacy and anti-African-American racism, it's a perfect time to be adding this to the conversation, uh, to adding how we think about Latinos. Uh, one of the other major contributions of the book is that you um, look at, you look towards Latin America um, and their history um, to tell us um, how that's connected to Latinos becoming a racial group in the U.S and you systematically do that. So can you tell us why that was important and how then that connects to the experience of Latinos once here in the US? Yeah, so in the first chapter, which is titled, We Are Here Because You Were There, I'm really trying to make that linkage between American imperialism and migration, migration north, right? And so, um, I start from the Mexican American period, right, which we're more aware of because half of Mexico is part of the United States where we're sitting at in Los Angeles, right? But, but really it's also is, is rampant throughout the Spanish Caribbean, right? The Dominican Republic and uh, Puerto Rico and Cuba and all of Central America, as you know very well. And, and frankly, all of Latin America too. I could have gone further, further south, right? But I focused on, on telling that story because there was, such, there was such U.S. corporate and military and political penetration of Central America and the Spanish Caribbean for all of the 20th century, and, and, and some of it starting in the, the 19th century, but certainly for all of the 20th century. And so when you actually break that down and you put all of that together in one space, as that chapter does, 
I think it's very, I think it's very powerful uh, to just kind of see it all at once because we tend to talk about, oh, El Salvador, that was a different, you know, that was an important story, but that story's there. Honduras, that story's there. Dominican Republic, that story's there. But when we actually weave it together and we talk about, you know, gunboat, gunboat diplomacy, and, and then we talk about the Contras and we talk about these, these the, you know, the Panama Canal and we, you know, right? It's all there in one place. And it, it lets us see how intertwined our country is with these countries and why we're, it's not an accident that people are coming to the United States. It is because we dislocated people because of our activities in those countries and because we actually participated in genocides you know, in those countries, right? And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interconnection that is, is persistent and strong. Along those lines, um, you and I, um, who are very much in this literature, uh, much because of your uh, foundational and seminal work that you uh, have done, as you spoke about in Manifest Destiny, know that uh, folks both in and outside of academia uh, it, 20 years ago, really believed that Latinos were going to be similar to the Irish and Italian immigrants, meaning that they would become part of the white American group and experience full, in, full integration. Uh, we have seen in the last 20, 30 years, quite reversal. Uh, what changed uh, and, and what, is, what do you and your book have to say about that? And, and, you know, here, another book that I would put into conversation um, is um, um, Vilma Ortiz and Eddie Teas's book, right, uh, Generations of Exclusion, which was a really critical um, study. And I'm just going to spend a, a little bit of time talking about their methodology because it, I think it really finally put to rest the assimilation story. So what they did is they took um, interviews that had been done in the late 60s with uh, Mexican Americans in Los Angeles and in San Antonio, and they went back and found those people again, and they interviewed them and their children, and in some cases also their grandchildren, 40 years later. And, and this is a quantitative analysis, right? So we have the same families observed over time and we found downward mobility right downward mobility and that's that's exactly um it's 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 not that there weren't some signs of assimilation there are people speak english after they've been here in the u.s over multiple generations right but what's persistent is the level of um living in segregated neighborhoods, going to segregated schools. Um, there's some uh, out marriage, marriage outside of, of the Mexican popul Mexican American population, but there's a lot that's still inside. Um, they look at all kinds of things and they find this persistent, um, really persistent racial subordination rather than assimilation. Whereas if you look at Italian Americans or Irish Americans, sure, if we go back to the early 20th century, um, there is a lot of discrimination. There were even lynchings of Italian Americans, right? And, but you don't see anything distinctive about Irish Americans and Italian Americans now in the main in terms of other white people. You just don't you just don't see that, right? So, so I think that that argument has been put to rest in terms of the data, but in terms of the popular imagination is still very much with us, right? And so people tend to say, um, what's, why are you talking about racism? Latinos are in the position that they're in because they're immigrants. And I say, well, actually only 20% of Latinos were born elsewhere, right? 80% were born in this country and a substantial percentage have been here for multiple generations. And yet we still find this persistent racial discrimination, uh, segregation in terms of residence, which leads to uh, de facto segregation of schools and so forth. Exactly, exactly. And this is gonna feed into the next question, which is, you know, 
you you really lay out a mountain of data to show those racial barriers, uh, those barriers, those specific barriers that Latinos endure, um, and you make the case for them really being a racial group. Um, can you talk to us about that? And then equally important, you come up with um, a, an important way to challenge that, and you call it the politics of, of accountability. Um, so can you walk us through that? Yeah, and I think, I think that even as we talk about um, anti-Latino racism, we also want to acknowledge that Latinos had some benefits certainly compared to African Americans, right? So what we often see is a kind of a hierarchy where we've got whites, Latinos, and African Americans. Even though I wanna put a big pin in that to say many Latinos are black and many are, are part black, right? We have, because of the legacy of Spanish colonialism and importation of African slaves into the Americas, we have African ancestry, many, all of us have African ancestry, many of us have more African ancestry rather than less, right? So I don't wanna separate those, but in terms of the American racial hierarchy, African Americans have been at the bottom, right? And so Latinos were in this middle group, still experiencing racism, but not being treated as badly as African Americans. For example, there was no de jure segregation, segregation by law of Mexican Americans in Texas or in California, right? Um, there was no de jure segregation of Puerto Ricans, but there was de facto segregation of those groups. And so I talk about that, and I talk about in particular in the education sphere, it wasn't really until the lawsuits of the 1960s and 1970s, and even going further, 1980s that you see that there's some attention to to redressing the inferior education that Latino children have. Unfortunately, because of the shifts in the law and in the courts, those avenues for litigation are now defunct. We don't have those tools and what we're seeing, look at what we're seeing in Los Angeles, right? Where LA Unified is is overwhelmingly students who are poor and students who are Latino. Um, um, now, in terms of the reparations that I talk about, it's not that I'm talking about reparations for, so it's very important that we understand, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna take our attention from reparations for slavery, right? For African-Americans, which is really, you know, on the table right now, being seriously discussed and as it should be. So what I like to remind people of is reparations come in many forms. There have been, in the past, um, the U.S. has made apologies, like we made an apology to Native Hawaiians. Um, there was a, a, a rep reparations for Japanese internment, and we made, um, that was a monetary one as well as an educational one. There was $20,000 to each person who was interned. But what I suggest is the most important uh, way to repair that legacy of imperialism that we were talking about and the education and um, uh, uh, economic um, uh, poverty, really, poverty and, and segregation into low wage jobs is to deal with this problem of immigration in two ways. The main way is by giving amnesty to all Latinos who are in the US now and who have been here for more than 10 years. And we did that before. We did that in 1986 with the immigration, IRCA it was called, the Immigration Regulation IRCA uh, and Something Act. Um, um, so we, we know how to do that. If we have the political will, if there is a win for the Democrats in, in um, the, the White House and in the Senate, we should do that um, immediately um, in, in, 2000, in 2021. Then the other piece of it would be group-wide amnesty, or um, sorry, not amnesty, asylum for Central Americans because when we look at what's happening in Central America right now, the people and the children and the families who are fleeing North are fleeing violence that we largely created. And so there, I think we sh there's no reason we should have people make individual asylum claims, 
because that's that's such a high bar we should be saying no we're going to treat you like we tra like we treated uh, soviet union refugees cuban refugees um, even Nicaraguan refugees in a particular time period and Vietnamese refugees. And we're going to say, you should all be able to come to this country and we welcome you because we are acknowledging our, our role in you being here. Thank you. Those are all really important solutions. We usually only account uh, or take examination of the barriers and here, um, uh, Dr. Gomez really looks at really plausible ways to resolve these issues uh, to make it fair for this group who has uh, experienced and continues to experience these barriers. Um, so Laura, in conclusion, can you remind us when the book is coming out, why if this is essential reading for everybody, and definitely that professors across disciplines is definitely a book that they should put on their syllabus and have their students read. Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, um, and I wanted to say that there's more information about the book at my website, www.lauraegomez.com. Um, and the book will be out next week. Um, so I'm just, just in time for Hispanic Heritage Month. And I think that in particular, when we're looking at the kind of demographics we have in Los Angeles um, and in California, um, because Latinos are such a significant part of the population, it's really a great opportunity, I think, for um, teachers, high school and college to link the Latino experience to the African American experience and really do compare and contrast, right? And, and really, um, this, this book really gives people the, the raw material to have those conversations. So I hope that it will move, move that, that, um, that debate and that inquiry forward because only by knowing those specific racisms, what I call the, the Latin anti-Latino racism and the anti-African American racism, can we fight them? Can we really mount a successful um, fight against them? And so I hope that this contributes to, to that project. Absolutely. It most, this book most definitely does that. Um, and again, this is also a very accessible book for everyone to pick up. Uh, again, my name is Celia Lacayo with LA Social Science. Make sure to subscribe and we'll catch you next time.